Okay, Abby Fish, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing re- well. Like, uh, stepped outside my normal podcast booth. I'm in the great outdoors. It's beautiful out here. Yeah, it looks like you're in a tropical environment. Yeah, very nice. You know, so how swimmers should be outdoors, got the pool in the background, you know, so yep. it's all good. Oh. So what's going on with you? You're doing some really interesting stuff in the swimming world and I'm just, uh, it caught my eye and uh, really interested in it. I think it's unique. It's different. Um, cutting edge. You're doing some great stuff. So talk to me about what you're doing. Yeah. So uh, I know you and I have crossed paths through the years. I mean, the swimming community is pretty small, um, but yeah, I've been bopping around doing different things. And just about over a year ago, uh, I started my own business called Swim Like a Fish. And my goal with the business is to help swimmers um, anywhere around the world get faster. Uh, So it's a lot of virtual swim coaching. Um, So it's definitely a little bit against the grind. It's a little different. It's very innovative. Um, but my goal is just to help people with new content and coaching and training plans to get them faster and to reach their swimming goals. Amazing. You know, I love it. I love the outside the box thinking and, um, uh, you know, not everybody's doing it. So that that's good news, but how, how do you go about it? How do you reach people? How do you coach virtually? Yeah. Well, just like podcasts and this video podcast and all that, the, the beauty of our cell phones and having, you know, easily accessible technology nowadays is way different than it was even a decade ago when I was swimming. Um, so I use array of different, an array of different software programs. I also use a lot of video analysis um, to be able to check in with my swimmers as if I was literally standing on deck coaching them, uh, along with writing different training plans and sets for them to, to do. So it's, uh, it's not the same as you would have a coach on deck and they'd be right there giving you the set and giving you their times. Um, it's a little bit more after the fact, but it still can be very effective. Um, and sometimes can even be a little bit more intricate than what you would get if you have a group of 40 swimmers in one coach and that coach is trying to give feedback to all 40 swimmers. Um, because the feedback that that swimmer is getting is obviously detailed and very specific to them. Yeah, I love it. Uh, look, to be honest, when I stepped away from college coaching a few years ago, I had a number of athletes reach out to me and, and ask if I was interested in doing something similar. So I, I continued working with Bruno Fratis virtually, and he ended up getting second at the World Championships in the 50 freestyle. And I, he was living in Florida and I was living in Alabama. So, you know, it's possible. Um, I, I coach a girl in Mexico virtually. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different spin on coaching. It's not exactly how you would you would want it you know to be hands-on but a lot of people don't have the circumstances and the and the capacity to have a coach of your quality on the deck so this is actually a really good next best choice yeah and that's that's the goal because i mean it shouldn't really be dependent on where your parents live or you know where you've grown up for your swimming accessibility um and like you and i probably could both agree that we want the sport of swimming to elevate and to get faster and for more people to get interested in it interested in it because the more that that happens the more money that gets pushed into the sport and the better the sport will get um so yeah i don't want it to be dependent on where you live on you know what quality of swim coaching you can get or even if you can like actually be coached in swimming. Um, so I was, I was actually over in Australia a couple years ago and it was so interesting to me. Um, I'd never been there. Uh, I'd always personally wanted to just go check out, uh, that area. And what was really unique to Australia that was very different to me from a USA swimming perspective was like most of the towns are coastal and most people learn how to swim. And it's very much a part of that society. Whereas in the U S here, we have so many landlocked States or States that don't really have access to water that there's a lot of people that don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like the populations between Australia to the U S like there's the same proportion and amount of swimmers in a smaller country, uh, like Australia as there is in the U S just because it's like more a part of their society. So I'd love to see more people in the U S be able to swim, no matter if they live in like south dakota or oklahoma versus california well and then this is a way to get quality coaching now you know you can get online and talk to a high level um, former athlete now coach like yourself who's got the experience and so you're not stuck in a small town anymore with small ideas or whatever it is or it might even be a big town where they don't have um, access to great coaching so uh, this is this is good i I love it so talk to us about your background a little bit where'd you grow up how'd you get into swimming 
Yeah. So I, I feel like swimming has been part of my life for literally as long as I can remember my own life. Um, my older brother and older sister swam um, and I was the youngest. So I kind of always was looking up to them and doing what they were doing. Uh, and when my brother decided to get into competitive swimming, uh, I was four years old and I, I told my mom, well, if he gets to go to swim practice, then I get to go to swim practice. Mm -hmm. And my mom was looking at this little four-year-old like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but she let me start swimming. And pretty much from there, I swam club all the way through until I, I went to the University of Georgia and I swam at UGA until 2012. Um, and then I started coaching, but was still kind of like postgraduately training until 2014. And then kind of the coaching took off and my, you know, my stepping back from swimming was actually kind of a natural transition and I've been coaching ever ever since. So where'd you grow up before you got to Georgia? Uh, so my family moved around like, I mean, I've moved 30, like almost 30 times now oh, um, wow. in my whole life. Yeah. So it's like, it's been pretty crazy. I always, I always get asked if my parents were military, but they, they aren't. Um, my dad worked for General Electric and it was just every year or two years he'd get transferred to a different plant. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I credit a lot of where I learned the most about swimming and like competitive swimming and getting to a, a higher level, um, being in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where I, I live now. Uh, I grew up swimming on Lakeside swim team under Mike DeBoer, um, who's mm -hmm. produced many great swimmers and multiple Olympians. Um, so I feel like he kind of took me from the level that I was at and then took me to like this next higher level and then was able to swim at UGA under Jack. So talk to me about that experience at UGA. Jack's, um, obviously one of the greatest coaches in us history um i'm trying to get him on the podcast too so help me out with that would you I um, <laughs> but he's hard to, he's hard to pin down he's always out hunting yes um, doing things <laughs> but yeah what was your experience like at georgia incredible women's program uh, especially mm -hmm. uh, renowned for that um obviously the men are doing fantastic too but talk to me about your experience yeah, so my experience at UGA, um, when I picked to go to UGA, I picked something that was very close to what I was doing in club from a training philosophy perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm the type of person that I like to work hard. I like to be around people that have like that culture of like, we're just determined and we're going to um, be honest and just kind of like put our heads down and grind. And UGA fit that mold um, pretty much to a T. Uh, it's also was close enough to Louisville, which is what I consider home. So it allowed me to you know, drive there and drive home if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, it was, it was overall a really nice experience. Um, I won't lie when I first got there kind of being like a big fish in a small, uh, small pond going to being a small fish in a big pond where you're surrounded by all these people that are so good. Um, you know, Olympians, world record holders, like you name it. Uh, it was a bit overwhelming for a while realizing that, you know, you are one of those people, but like, where do you fit in that scenario as well too? Um, Cause for a while there, the UGA women's team during the time frame that I was a part of it was super, super dominant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We like over qualified women for NCAAs like two years in a row. Uh, so, and we were like national champions a couple of times and runner ups and things. So it was like, we were always kind of in the mix. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, there wasn't like a time or a chance for a day off. It was kind of like, you know, if you showed up today, you better be ready to throw down because if you're not, then the person beside you is. And like, that's just how it rolls. Is it more of the traditional type of work that you're talking about when you say, I like to work hard? Are you, are you talking like volume and just grinding and just kind of going at it, you know, very competitive, of course, but like, it's just, uh, you know, that work is attitude, turn up to work and, and grind. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's, I mean, I still have that mentality as a coach myself now, but the technique coaching and kind of the more intricate coaching that we were talking about that I do, it's definitely different than what I was given and a part of at UGA. Um, I wouldn't say we were like a total high volume team, like comparatively to other programs, but you know, our afternoon practices were anywhere from six to 7,500. Our mornings were 4,500 to five. You know, we doubled three times a week. Um, I've done crazy sets like Harvey Humphreys would have us do like a 3000 for time once a month, you know, 3100's best average. Like I can name those grinding sets and mm -hmm. then like, oh, I've done that maybe not once, twice, but maybe five times. And yeah. 
I remember the best one and I remember the worst. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then yeah. how do you go from that mentality to doing what you're doing where you're, where you're valuing technique? You know, it's easy to get stuck in that mentality of, hey, work pays off and work works type thing. Hmm. Um, but then how do you go from valuing technique into your business now? Yeah, so I got to a point where I was swimming um, – pretty well, but I plateaued pretty significantly in college. And I do credit that to the fact that like my training for, you know, five years prior to college was one thing. And then my training in college was the same. And so I was doing essentially the same thing for almost a decade. Um, and my body adjusted to that. And wow. so I majored in exercise science. And so I like, you know, kind of nerding out on the energy systems and how things work and why they do what they do. And so I started thinking as I was still swimming, like, well, what could I do or what could be different for me to get me to that next level? Um, and that was kind of like the foundational thoughts of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, I kind of wish that this opportunity was able to be given to a swimmer like me. Um, Cause it's like, if you get it from USA swimming, it's only to the national team or if you're on the national team that mm -hmm. year. So it's not like the services that they provide was provided to any swimmer uh, of any level. Um, so yeah, I was like, well, I guess if someone maybe helped me a little bit on my technique, maybe I got a little bit stronger in the weight room. Maybe if I looked at these other pieces of the pie, uh, you know, the pie could have been better at the, at the end of the day. So how did you make that transition from, from kind of being a grinder, being a worker to now being a technician? There's obviously a period of time in between where you had to learn, you had to study. What are the ways that you did that? Yeah, so I've traveled a lot. And one of the, I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I first started coaching was um, the, the best way to learn is always to continue to be a student. Mm -hmm. um, so wherever I am, even if I'm like, you know, gallivanting around Massachusetts for the fun of it or whatever I'm doing personally, I'll try to reach out to coaches, get on deck with different coaches, you know, formulate relationships and just have conversations of like, Hey, Brett, what did you do on Monday? And why'd you do that? And what worked and what did it uh, just to kind of continue to keep my brain fresh and to hear new things. Um, and so, yeah, as I've worked through just many different programs, I worked at the race club under Gary Hall. I did work at USA swimming. Uh, I co-owned Ritter sports performance for a while. Like I've just been kind of trying to have all these really other great minds help my mind expand and stay fresh and to, uh, just teach me, teach me new things. The world tells you that you should go down a certain path and everybody does this and this is how you get to the next level. And this is kind of the next progression. And obviously you've gone away from that in a way and you're, you're blazing your own trail. So was there a period of time where you started traditional coaching and were just disillusioned with it? Or was it immediately like, no, nope, I know exactly what I want to do and I'm going to take a chance on it. Yeah. So that's actually an amazing question. And I don't think anyone's ever phrased it that way because yes. it's a hundred percent. Yeah. It's like a hundred percent what I had to sit down and figure out. Um, so there, there was this pivotal point. So I, I went to UGA, I went to grad school there. I started volunteering with UGA's team kind of like as I was still swimming, but not swimming mm -hmm. um, competitive really. And I got this internship at USA swimming, working in their high performance department. And I went out to the Springs. I worked under Russell. I was with all the Olympians and I was just this like wide eyed kid, just so excited to be doing what I was doing. And then I realized, well, there's one Russell and there's like very few spots at this NGB to be able to do this. So like, how am I going to do this? Um, and my goal was originally then, well, I guess I'll just wait until like Russell retires or something happens and I'll just get that job and it'll be the, what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, I ended up taking a regular coaching role, um, at Nashville aquatic club being like a age group coach, it was full time. Um, uh, but it had this flair of video analysis where I, you know, I was still talking to people like, I want to do video. I want to do this, but I had like literally no idea how I'm going to be able to create a role that's never been created before. So looking back through all my different coaching roles, they've always had like a virtual component, a video component to them. Cause I was always kind of trying to keep that um, in my side pocket, but at the same time trying to build that into something. So eventually mm. I could be doing that on its own. So looking forward at the time, it was like, 
I don't know, I'm going to make the next best choice. Yeah. And looking backwards, it all, yeah, it all makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's just like anything. You got to kind of back yourself. First of all, you got to, you got to trust that and you got to have a vision kind of where you, you, you want to go, but you've also got to understand that there's steps. You just can't jump to the next level as much as you want to get there quickly. It's like, hmm. okay, I got to keep working at this. So it's obviously been a process for you now over 10 years where you've finally built an established business and a base and something that, you know, you can rely on a hundred percent that's yours. And that, that must feel good too. The fact that it's yours and you built it. Yeah, it does. I never thought at the age of 30, I'd be a business owner and uh, like wearing my name on like my shirt. And I, some days it's like very like, wow, someone pinched me. Like, this is pretty crazy. And other days it just feels like, you know what, it all, it all does make sense. Like I had to lay the foundation. I had to work some different jobs and, you know, learn new things and just kind of like get myself prepared to be able to manage a team and run a business. I mean, it's one thing to know swimming, but another thing to run, I'm sure, as you know, like actually run a business that's profitable and mm -hmm. that helps people. It's like this constant balance and yo-yo of uh, trying to keep everything in check. That's interesting. In terms of the business side of things, what are some of the things just generally that you had to set up, maybe that you had to learn in order to become a business? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I didn't study marketing or business in college. Um, so everything that I've done as far as like social media, like editing videos, building mm. a website, like it is literally a hundred percent been self-taught. Mm. Um, so there's been tons of mistakes made in all of those realms. Yeah. Um, and also tons of uh, obviously good stories and good successes as well too. So um, I've learned pretty much everything from the ground up, from incorporating a business, getting a business, like copyright laws, all of that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a lot more than I expected when I was like, oh, I think I'm going to go on Instagram and upload a video of swimming and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm kind of at that phase where you're, at, where you're talking about. So I need to probably talk to you at another time about some of the business stuff, because I'm still learning that too. There's so much that goes into it and yeah. so much you have to learn as you go, but what would be um, some good pieces of advice for someone that does want to start off a business? I mean, cause there's not many of you in the world, but I'm sure that there is a market for it, especially, I mean, swimming is worldwide. So somebody in Spain could do the same thing, but in terms of just setting up like you and you being a trailblazer, what, what piece of advice could you give somebody? Um, well, yeah. So I think the best piece of advice um, I ever got in regards to that, especially when it comes to like you being like your own brand. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I was sitting in a meeting, I guess probably a week and a half ago or so now. And one of my friends was in the meeting and he was saying, you know, you're learning how to build a business off something that you're really passionate about, which a lot of people would love to learn. Mm -hmm. And it kind of like took me back. I was like, oh, that's true, but I don't, I don't really see it like that every single day. Um, and so, yeah, like popping off of that and understanding that I think something that I struggled with for a while was being young and seeing all these high-end coaches that I was having conversations with that, you know, have established Olympians like yourself, you mm -hmm. know, like you have this repertoire and you already have this name um, that someone young like me kind of raised in my hand saying, hey, uh, I I'd like to say something too, mm -hmm. is very intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of makes you, I don't know, just second guess yourself, second guess, second guess your self-worth uh, and question whether or not you should be up there with all those people. Um, so yeah, one of the best pieces of advice is just do it and do it consistently because the yeah. more you push yourself and the more you get out of your comfort zone, the easier it is to get in front of a camera and be like, oh, hey, Brett, how's it going? How are you doing today? Versus, you know, being nervous or like, does my hair look okay? Or all these other conver the conversations that go on in your brain. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Good, good advice. You're right. I mean, I've gone through that too, in terms of just, uh, I hated the sound of my voice when I, when I started a podcast, people were like, <laughs> you need to, you need to play it back and listen to yourself. I'm like, I can't do it. And I was like, no, yeah. I hate it. Um, yeah. But now, you know, I listen back and I, and I watch myself in terms of critiquing yourself. You have to, you know, so it's part mm -hmm. of, it's part of that as well, but yeah, interesting stuff. Um, how has yeah. the pandemic uh, affected your business? So the pandemic has been really interesting. So I launched May of last year. Um, so we were super young and the first year or so I was still like 
kind of separating things from where I was before and just kind of getting my ducks in a row and figuring out the business model. And, you know, I was having more like abstract thoughts than literal, like I was getting in and doing things every Mm. single day. Um, So I didn't start actually being able to make profit until later into 2019. And so then you put that straight into 2020 and it was kind of like, oh, well, this is a this is interesting because we have these people that are the base and we have clients, but then at the same time, like, what are we going to do uh, from a growing perspective, especially during a time frame where I didn't feel very comfortable, like pushing sales and asking for money and all those things from, from people when I knew a lot of the world was struggling. Um, so what I did during the pandemic was launch some free dry land classes uh, and doing some free video analysis for people. And that in itself like blew up around the world. Um, mm-hmm. There were just so many people that were eager for content and yeah. absorbing things and sitting at home uh, that the brand awareness that came out of 2020 for us was actually really, really great. Uh, and I didn't, ex- I didn't expect it. I didn't expect people to, to absorb it like they did, but I'm really thankful because I feel like at this point I've been around the swimming world enough that it's like people know that I'm in the swimming world, but sometimes people don't really know what I'm doing in the swimming mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Well, yeah. hopefully this will help. This will, this will help a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I, sure. I noticed what you're doing. You're doing great stuff. And so it's just really interesting. Um, you know, go from that non-traditional a little bit and just see what other people are doing in the sport because the sport needs to evolve and it's people Mm -hmm. like you that are going to push the boundaries and take it to another level. And I think, honestly, there's a lot of people looking at what you're doing now, especially because of the pandemic and being like, oh, wow, that's actually something that can really work. And and you're probably thankful that you launched the business the year before the pandemic, really, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny because like, I feel like So it was really the race club was the start of me understanding how to work on a virtual, like online and how to like create videos and YouTube and like how SEO works and just all these other like virtual marketing things. Um, And yeah, it's, it's kind of funny to me because like, I feel like I've been doing webinars for years and creating videos for a long time. And then I saw a bunch of other companies during the pandemic kind of scrambling to figure out how to take what is their in-person product or role and then morph it to fit this digital realm. And so I was like, oh, I kind of feel like a pioneer over here. I've been hanging out doing webinars for like five years at this point. And now literally everybody's offering webinars. It was like such a saturated market Mm. um, in the middle of the pandemic in the swimming world because like every swimming company was offering something kind of a webinar like. Yeah. I see some of the videos you're putting out now. How do you determine what you want to put out that's, that's free to access and then stuff that you want to charge for? Yeah. So I have a huge library, which I, it kind of goes into the advice that I was saying earlier. Uh, I remember looking at like go swim and other larger companies and just being like, oh man, I wish I had like a ton of videos that one day I could just pull through my library and upload something and do that. But it was like, for the longest time, it was like, I would go to a pool, shoot videos, upload a video, and that would be, you know, the process. And it would be just like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. And now I finally have built up this library because it's been long enough and I've learned how to be, you know, more efficient at it that I can just go through and pull through different things to, depending on what I want to talk about, if it's backstroke or the crossover turn or whatnot. Um, So yeah, depending on the video, the quality of the video, and also what I'm trying to promote um, via social media, whether it's a blog or whatnot, that kind of determines the the content and where it goes. Um, Also the person that's in the video, because obviously they have to have a say if it's not me. uh, too, on where that video can be hosted. Um, So it's definitely an array of like, factors depending on it but i found that really good quality videos uh like where you're sitting at if you shot in that water right now because Mm. the lighting looks so awesome Mm -hmm. you would show out with some really nice underwater film yeah absolutely is there um are are you particularly aiming for a certain level like do you go from beginner all the way to the olympian or is there a market that you're aiming at Uh, I would say like the two biggest demographics that I really work with are club swimmers. So pretty much anyone from the age of like 11 to 16, 17 is one of my main markets. And then um, master swimmers. Uh, And that can be obviously in an array of different ages. Um, But those are kind of the main two people that I talk to. Uh, I think every young coach, like young Abby would have been like, I want all the Olympians. Like I want the high end swimmers. I want this, I want that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I have found that I actually really enjoy coaching younger kids um, and just kind of helping them develop personally along with, you know, swimming wise. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is very cool when you're dealing with someone who's fast as well, or, you know, on the national team and I've done my fair share of that, but that isn't like my main target market. Do you um, have a relationship at all with their home coach? Do you try and um, check in with their home coach or you know, any form of interaction with their home coach? Uh, sorry, you kind of whipped out for a second. What did you ask? Oh, so in terms of the home coach, how, how do you have interaction with the home coach? So obviously you're working with athletes that are in different programs. Is there any interaction with the home coach? Yes. And this is actually something I really pride myself on because um, with being in different roles where I've done other virtual coaching, I've kind of been in different scenarios where I, you know, was either like the swimmer didn't want to tell their coach or it was kind of like a secret. And I didn't feel comfortable with that as far as like how that, you know, kind of looked on my reputation and, and everything. So whenever I work with someone, one of the first things I do is either if that coach wasn't the person who contacted me, I will contact them and tell them, Hey, you know, I've got a request from so-and-so they want to do X. What do you think? Is this like kind of combating what you're doing or will this add into the equation? And do you want to be included on these zoom calls um, and kind of let them lead the conversation, uh, which, you know, sometimes it is like, it kind of bites you in the butt because being honest and being forward with that. And some coaches, you know, don't really want their swimmers going outside of where they're normally coaching. Mm. Um, you know, I might lose clients, but at the same time, I'd rather feel really like happy with my reputation, feel like I'm being honest and not being, uh, you know, compromising any swimmer and their coach's relationship because at the end of the day, like that their coach is their primary coach and everything that I do is secondary and hopefully they can see as an addition and an added benefit versus any sort of like competitive pullback or, you know, I'm trying to recruit their swimmer or take their swimmer away from their program. Yeah. What about in terms of success? How do you measure it? How, how do you measure it for yourself? And then how does the, the client measure the success that they're having with you? Yeah. So, um, one of the main things that I love is analytics and I've always been very data oriented. Um, even with my own swimming, I geek out and break down my own events and look at my splits and figure out where I could improve. Um, so obviously swimming is a very concrete sport. What you get is what you see on the, um, the clock. And then there's all these factors that you can manipulate to try to manipulate that time. Uh, so yeah, obviously times are uh, a big deal. And then within the races, if we're looking at someone's progress, um, maybe we're not just looking at the overall swim time. Maybe we're looking at other metrics like their turn time or how much time they spent underwater, or how many breaths they took. And we use those as, um, different standards to kind of gauge against to see, you know, okay, what does this overall time look like when we do X or Y or Z? Um, and how can we change that? moving forward or should we adjust it or should it stay the same? And that can be an easy way to measure success, which isn't just completely outcome oriented. Nice. I love it. Well, listen, what, uh, how can people get in contact with you? What's the best way to make uh, make a contact? Yeah. So, I mean, my, I think my website is right there. Um, but okay. if you want to check out the website, it's swimlikeafish.org. I'm also uh, very active on social media. Um, Instagram is probably the most active, uh, but my Instagram handle is at um, the T-H-E and then a fish one. Uh, and then also you could find Swim Like a Fish on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Uh, so yeah, if you Google all that, you'll be, be able to check it out. Beautiful. Abby, well, uh, listen, I really appreciate you sharing all this with us. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. Big fan. And um, hopefully we can chat uh, offline as well. And I can learn some business stuff from you. I'm, I'm still figuring all that out. <laughs> yes, no problem. Thanks for the opportunity, Brett. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.